Hello, everyone. My name is Janeta, and I am a student at Yuma Museum, and I will come to you to this week's brown bag. We actually have two presentations today, one by Jennifer Larios and one and the other by Kara Larson, both of whom are graduate students here in UMA and the Department of Anthropology. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for and the end for a combined Q&A for both speakers. So please write questions or leave comments throughout both of the presentation in the QA feature of Zoom. You also have the possibility to turn on or off the, the live transcripts. Before introducing you to the fabulous work of our speakers, I would like to recognize the emplacements of the University of Michigan on indigenous lands that have in part allowed for our meeting today to occur. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa and Bodewadami nations made the single largest gifts to the early university when they ceded land through Article 16 of the treaty at the foot of the rapids, so their children might be educated. Yuma recognized and reaffirms their sovereignty, contribution, and ancestral and contemporary ties to this land and will work to hold our university more accountable in sustaining mutually beneficial partnerships with indigenous peoples, communities, and nations. Our first speaker for today is Jennifer Larios, a fourth year doctoral candidate with research interests in social inequality, urbanism, and craft productions in the Andes and Mesoamerica. Uh, Jennifer receives a bachelor's degree in anthropology from UCLA and during her time at Michigan has won several grants and fellowships, including the Graduate Research Fellowship through the National Science Foundation, the Lewis and Clark Fund for Explore Exploration and Field Research and the Rackham International Research Award. In 2019, Jennifer led the mapping project at the site of Ungara in the Cañete Valley of Peru to understand the spatial configuration and the architectural history of the site. She is currently working on a project at the site of Monte Alban in Oaxaca, Mexico. Jennifer's talk today is titled The Pottery of Chincha, Revisited. I pass it to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about a project that I've been working on and off for the last few years. Um, this presentation is um, a summary of, of some of the um, conclusions that I've managed to reach or just some of the uh, questions that I've been able to uh, develop based on the analysis that I've done. Um, so um, before I get started with the presentation, I do want to say that I live in a very busy intersection um, and I live across the street from a market. Um, so if there are any strange noises, I would like to apologize in advance for that. Um, so the Chincha Valley um, is located um, in the south coast of Peru. Um, I will be focusing today on the pottery of the late intermediate period and the late horizon. Um, during the uh, late intermediate period and the late horizon, um, this region was occupied by the Chincha Kingdom. Um, and in the late horizon, the um, Inca Empire uh, expanded into this area. Um, and uh, this, uh, the kingdom is in Indian studies well known for um, it, from the historical records um, because the Inca and the Chincha formed an alliance. Um, some scholars think that this might have to do um, because there are census records, uh, colonial census records that indicate that there were merchants uh, living in the Chincha Valley, which is kind of contradictory to the, to the models of, of the Indian economy that we have. Um, but this is beyond uh, the, uh, the study um, I'll mostly be focusing on the pottery and trying to understand if there are any insights into the production and the distribution of the pottery itself. 
Um, the Chincha Valley is also known as one of the sources of of uh, the well-known ceramic collection acquired by Max Uhle in the 1900s. Um, this collection was uh, analyzed by Kroger and Strong in 1924, and most notably Dorothy Menzel in 1966. Um, Menzel's work was, was groundbreaking, but it was limited by the fact that the um, collections that she analyzed were obtained from looted mortuary contexts, um, some of which were from Providence and most of which were concentrated near the, the Chincha um, administrative capital of La Sentinela. Um, moreover, Menzel's study solely relied on the pottery to infer social political dynamics um, in the South Coast um, during this late pre-Hispanic period. Um, so it is just worth noting that even to this point, even though there have been a lot more studies since the 1960s in the, the Chincha Valley, there's still not enough information for us to really understand the, the uh, relationship between the polities and the South Coast during this period. So I'll, I'll just be, like I said, be focusing on the pottery itself to try to understand uh, the nature of production and distribution within the Chincha Kingdom itself. Um, and here are just some pictures of what the what Chincha pottery looks like. Um, these are from the Phoebe uh, Ahurst Museum of Anthropology um, at the University of, uh, um, at Berkeley. Um, and these are uh, these are typical examples. These are actually from the Max Uli collections, which I mentioned previously. Here are two more. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what Chincha pottery looks like. Um, so the pottery sample that I studied um, consists of 1,721 shirts from 26 sites throughout the coast, the lower and the middle Chincha Valley. Um, as you can see, I hope you can see my, my mouse. Uh, uh, here's the, the Chincha capital of the coast um, and uh, the, the middle valley. And, and the lower valley that I'm talking about. Um, so it, it's worth noting that this sample does come from other superficial or insecure contexts. Um, but I guess to my uh, to my benefit, this is the, the first ceramic study um, in the in the Chincha Valley, um, at least the first uh, late pre-Hispanic uh, Chincha pottery study that incorporates pottery from uh, multiple sites throughout the valley. Um, another problem that I, I feel that I should mention is that the majority of the sample comes from Las Huacas, um, which is right here in the lower valley. Um, but there are a uh, few other sites with comparative samples and there have been previous studies by Dan Sanwise at Lo Demas, um, Javier Alcalde at Pampa de la Pelota, um, and at La Sentinela um, and by Craig Morris and Evilio Santillana. Um, and so there, uh, I do have information, um, additional information with which I can compare my data with. Um, okay, so the analysis. So I looked at vessel form. Um, the analysis showed that out of all of the vessel forms identified, a majority of them were found throughout all of the valley. So there were no uh, forms that were restricted to certain um, to certain sites or certain areas, um, except a few. Um, these images here that I have, these drawings that I made are uh, the typical uh, Tincha assemblage. Um, and again, they're found uh, in all of the areas that I, that I analyzed. Um, there are a few rare forms, and those forms were found at Las Huacas, um, but this discrepancy could be, as I mentioned, as a result of the size of the sample. Um, but it could also be related to the fact that Las Huacas was an administrative center, and it perhaps had um, exclusive access to either these, the, the, these forms or perhaps the, the spheres of exchange um, uh, if these forms are not local. Um, and imports from other places in the South Coast or even further away. Um, I also looked at paste, paste texture and composition. Um, I, I did not do compositional studies um, 
like neutron activation analysis or petrographic as uh, these are uh, collections from projects that I, I'm, they're not, you know, something that I have direct access to. Um, uh, I mean, I did analyze them, but they had to be returned. So I wasn't able to do those, those studies. Um, but I did take a digital microscope. Um, and so what I was able to determine is that about 76% of the entire sample is um, comprised of fine texture paste. Um, clay is available in the Chincha Valley, um, but no studies have been done in order to determine which clay sources have, uh, were used by Chincha potters um, or which sources they may have been exploiting. Um, so from uh, the dynolite images that I took, so uh, cases that I was perhaps um, uh, when I was doing my initial analysis was categorizing as a uh, course. Um, once I took the, did the analysis with the, with the digital microscope, the dynolite, um, I noticed that even these coarse, um, uh, these shards with a uh, coarse paste, the paste itself is, um, uh, is fine. And so what then is affecting the, the, um, the, the coarseness is the inclusions um, themselves or the, the size of the inclusions. Um, uh, and so something that I also noticed was that throughout the um, entire sample, at least all of the, the, the shirts that I was able to get um, dynolite images from, um, it appears that even, um, so they were, so even when there is a range in the, the, um, the, the size of the inclusions, there, the, the inclusions tend to be consistent in size. So as you can see here in this image, the, the larger inclusions are about the same size and then the smaller inclusions are the same size. And that, that's just an, an everywhere. Um, if, if the inclusions are just small, they're going to be consistently small about the same size. So what I'm thinking here is that either the, they were using different clays with a uh, different, uh, that had not either natural uh, inclusions that varied in size, or there were just the, if the clays didn't have the um, uh, um, inclusions, natural, naturally occurring inclusions, then Chincha powders were making specific choices to um, screen um, uh, the, the inclusions and add whatever um, size inclusions they needed based on the function of what that vessel was going to be like. So for example, the, uh, the vessels with the more uh, coarse um, inclusions would be for cooking, for example. Um, Another variable that I looked at is paste color. Um, so orange paste are the most common color of paste throughout the, the valley. Um, however, other paste colors like brown and gray paste are not restricted to certain areas. Um, uh, so again, the, the only technical choice that, that really seems to they're making is, is uh, the application of these uh, size size of inclusions. Um, let's see. Um, another uh, variable that I analyzed um, is firing conditions. Um, so ultimately, what it, what affects space color is uh, the conditions of firing and. Uh, the organic inclusions that are being added, which unfortunately are something that I, I would not be able to identify because those would get fired away. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, that the majority of the sample is um, completely oxidized. In other words, that um, in the majority of the matrices uh, that I analyzed, they were consistently one color. Um, that to me suggests that there was um, uh, uh, control of firing um, conditions. 
Um, another uh, another uh, interesting thing that I noticed is that um, uh, there does seem to be a preference for these brighter hues, uh, whether it's 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 brown or orange. Um, they're they're choosing. Um, they they have the knowledge to produce these brighter hues, and then there's so there's that tendency to to get that. Um, and further evidence to support that there is um, knowledge of, of open fire, firing contexts and that change of potters were skilled enough to control these open firing contexts is that we also have the blackware. Um, and so um, these uh, blackware is found um, throughout all of the, the regions analyzed and it's perhaps the, the finest potter in, in the in, found in the Chincha Valley. Um, the blackware is really interesting because it could have been imported. Um, this is a style that's really typical of the, the North Coast of Peru. Um, and so, um, it, as we heard from uh, Dr. Bonger's talk um, a few weeks back, um, there are, there's evidence for um, changes in mortuary practice patterns. Um, there's evidence in textile production and also preliminary DNA analyses suggest that there were communities uh, from the north coast in the, the Chincha Valley that were perhaps being resettled um, during the late horizon by the Inca Empire. Um, and so even though that these, these uh, vessels could have been imported, um, the forms that we find are not very conducive to traveling. And then with the, the, the microscope, with the images that I took, the dynolite images, the inclusions and the paste seem to be very similar to um, the, the local pottery. Um, so overall, um, there uh, is consistency in the in compositional variables. Um, sorry, there's a truck that just distracted me. Sorry. Um, so there's a, a consistency uh, in uh, compositional variables. Um, so there is that, that control of the firing. Um, the pace is fine um, throughout the entire sample, it seems like. Um, the inclusions, they tend to be the same uh, type of materials that, they're, that, that are uh, within the pace. And then the size of, of, of the inclusions is also being controlled for. Um, what then varies is, are the aesthetic and functional variables. So for example, there's uh, one of the standard uh, jars, uh, typical chincha form that will be found throughout the entire, uh, the three different regions that I analyzed, but it'll be found in in different sizes, different thicknesses, um, different colors. Um, and most notably, what sticks out to me is that you have this, this, this form, but there's differences in the surface treatment and the, the lip form, um, which I didn't go into um, because it's just a whole other beast and I only have about 20 minutes to present. Um, but, um, yeah, so for me, to me, this this suggests that there, um, there, there, there may have been standardization, um, uh, but not centralization, um, and so, um, so again, there, there are perhaps these these norms that um, are these valley wide, like kingdom wide, or perhaps even community norms as to what forms. Uh, we as you know, for example, the the the, the chincha they uh, would have um, wanted to use or 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 liked or preferred for the types of activities that they were doing, or perhaps they were even it, it could be that there was a consumer preference in the in the forms and also the designs, which I didn't talk much about because that also is is too much to go into in in the time allotted. Um, but yeah, as I said, because there is consistency in these um, in these uh, functional variables, um, there is to some degree standardization. 
but because then you have the, the variation in these aesthetic um, variables, I'm thinking perhaps there is not centralization in the production of pottery. Um, and the, the high energy expenditure or, or just energy expenditure and making sure that the pottery for the most part, um, you know, there, there is this consistency in the, the, the types of vessels that are found in the area um, and that they, they look alike and that they're made um, with the same types of materials that they tend to be um, brighter in, in hue. Um, th those, those kinds of variables to me su suggest that um, there, it's more of a community um, community based production rather than household production. So I, I, I think that there wouldn't be so much um, consistency um, and the, the ceramics wouldn't be as fine. The, the decorations that we find wouldn't be consistent, um, which is another thing that I also didn't really go into too much, but the, the decorations are consistent. Ooh. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, and another thing that, that could potentially be happening at Pampa de la Pelota, um, one of the sites in, in the Chincha Valley that has been excavated, um, and at um, um, Maini in Pisco, which is just uh, one valley south, um, there uh, uh, scholars have, have found um, uh, ovens or, or like firing pits. Um, specifically at Maini, there is evidence to suggest that um, the, there were potters in the community and potters were sharing um, the, the, um, the firing area um, in this, yeah, in this town. Um, and so that, that's a possibility of, of what could be happening. Um, again, unfortunately, we don't have um, enough data to say with certainty how production or um, distribution is organized but um, there, 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 there are indications of standardization and um, perhaps uh, um, decentralization in, in, in the production. So um, those are just some, some things that I'm thinking about. Um, I really look forward to everyone's um, any questions or comments, uh, critiques. Uh, um, yeah, just looking forward to having a discussion because this is something that I've been um, just, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot, but I've also been fighting with it a lot for the past couple of years. So thank you. Um, and so I have a bibliography if anyone is more interested in reading about this and then acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Thank you for this great talk, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer will answer your question after we hear our second presentation, which will be from Kara Larson. Kara will take us to another geographic region. Kara is a first year doctoral student with a research interest in stable isotope analysis to archaeology, migration, seasonal mobility, and early state formation in the Near East, Eastern Europe, and the Southern, Southern Caucasus. She holds a master's degree in applied anthropology from Mississippi State University, where she continues to be a ju junior research affiliate. Kara has recently published two articles about the final remains from Tel El Hesi in Israel, where she is also a junior staff member and the primary faunal and isotope analyst. Kara holds similar position as a staff member and specialist with the Kirbet Samali archaeological project and the Tel Burna archaeological project. Kara's talk today is titled Rising Complexity on the Frontier, Isotope Evidence of <laughs> Administration at Iron Age Kirbet Samali Israel. Please join me in welcoming Kara in her presentation. And after Kara finishes, we'll have a section for questions and answers. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first, thank you, Jenny, for that awesome presentation. And thank you for that introduction. Like Johnny said, my name is Carol Larson, and I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Michigan. And I'm so excited to have this platform to share the culmination of my master's research 
that was conducted at Mississippi State University. So jumping right in, uh, current research on the reconstruction of complex political shifts that occurred during the Iron Age in the Southern Levant exists in a limited capacity with questions remaining on economic connections, if any, to outside regions. Traditionally, the Iron Age 2A has been understood to represent this transition from a mixture of independent tribes and settlements to a small territorial or tribal-based kingdom under centralized rule. Some scholars believe this political coalescence represents the first steps towards the rise of secondary states, potentially indicating the emergence of Israel and Judah, while others push this rise in complexity later to the ninth century. Excavations of a small site in the outskirts of these political entities highlights the emergence of economic complexity in line with arguments for earlier development of secondary states. Here, I present my final isotopic research project at this particular light to shine some light on this debate. So placing yourselves on the landscape, the small site called Kerbet Simili is slightly larger than one acre and is located directly in the peripheral border region between proposed Judah to the east and Cilicia to the west. While this in Levant contains both C3 and C4 plants due to seasonal shifts between the dry and rainy season, the primary vegetation composition in the Hesse region primarily consists of C3 plants. The Wadi El Hesse, a primary water source, is also close by, demonstrating the strategic placement of the site in connection to the larger region. So looking more in depth at the occupation layers in this project, phase four dates to the mid 10th century and shows the extent of a large singular building structure with a variety of smaller rooms throughout. Excavations here revealed several interesting artifacts that give clues to the building's purpose. In particular, square 44 yielded a stone installation in the floor, possibly a pot stand or libation stand, along with several associated loom weights. In other rooms, several artifacts of note were uncovered, including Egyptian scarabs and six clay boule. Following the destruction layer, occupation of the building quickly resumed in phase three, dating to the late 10th century. More artifacts of interest surfaced from square 44, including an altar, leading the project directors to conclude that the site was probably used for cultic purposes. A large storage vessel and a zoomorphic lion head were also found. Other notable signs from this space include a grouping of polished astragalite bones, a ceramic chalice, and a female figurine. So while Kerbet Simili was initially postulated and excavated um, under the thought that it was a small Iron Age domestic hamlet, interpretations following these recent excavations have suggested a possible Iron Age administrative structure. The project excavator suggests that the structure was utilized as an administrative outpost that engage in regional exchange networks. However, these connections are still debated and hotly contested. Entering into this research project, I sought to reveal how the occupants at Kerbet Smale used and exploited their food resources, and through the identification of those food ways, a system better understanding the site's potential regional integration during the 10th century. To address herd management practices, Carbon, oxygen, and strontium isotopic analyses were selected as proxies for animal diet, water intake, and mobility as a means to understand the food procurement for the occupants at the site. So specifically, if the animals were herded locally, it is hypothesized that the isotopic results would show local isotopic signatures indicated by the intake of the surrounding hefty vegetation throughout the animal's lives and a low degree of variation demonstrating a lack of mobility. This would suggest that the animals were herded by local pastoralists and do not represent evidence of exchange acting within a larger administrative network. Now, if the animals were commodities brought into Kerbet Simili, it is suggested that the isotopic results would indicate that the animals were herded outside of the Hesse environment prior to arrival at Kerbet Simili, signified by a shift in herd management practices during the animal's lives and a higher degree of isotopic variation demonstrating greater mobility. This would indicate that the animals were products of potential specialized pastoralists and that there was a level of regional integration between producer and consumer, suggesting Kerbet Simili functioned as an administrative post integrated into a potential larger political and or economic network. 
mature mandible molars from sheep, goat, and cows that maintain their structural integrity from phase three and phase four were selected for stable isotope sampling and were sequentially sampled along each tooth as is pictured here. M2 and M3 molars were selected due to tighter established enamel growth chronology. So for sheep, goats, and cows, the second molar is formed soon after birth, roughly around two months of age, and is completed at one year. The formation of the third molar begins at one year of age and takes about 12 months to form. So intertooth sampling across the molars allows for a reconstruction of animals' life history, which provides in-depth analysis on herd management practices and mobility. 20 individuals from the proposed administrative space were selected for testing. 10 originated from phase four and 10 originated from phase three. The ovicaprine teeth were separated and identified as either goat or sheep based on morphological differences in molar structure. In total, seven of the molars were identified as goat and nine were identified as sheep and are collectively referred here uh, as ovicaprine. Four cattle specimens were included as a preliminary comparison between large and small stocks. So now for the exciting stuff, what did I find? Due to different intertooth patterns and correlation to growth periods within the data, the results are separated by molar type and will be displayed in that manner. Starting with carbon for ovicaprines, the M2 samples are mapped here in orange and the M3 samples are mapped in blue. The carbon isotope values indicate some differences in plant intake between those second and third molars. Looking at only the second molar samples, the goats resulted in higher carbon values with variation in comparison to the sheep. Ultimately, the carbon intake present in the second molars indicated varied mixed C3, C4 plant diet. In contrast, the mean M3 carbon values indicated consumed diet of primarily C3 plants and very minimal C4 vegetation and are noticeably less varied in comparison to those second molar samples. The lowered carbon values in the sampled M3 molars demonstrates a shift towards the ingestion of C3 vegetation and a stabilization of a C3 diet for the remainder of the M3 enamel growth period. The cattle carbon samples are slightly lower than the average carbon values observed in the sheep and goat, but the samples show little to no differentiation across two types. The values present in the cattle indicate a primarily C3 diet, and show minimal indication of diet change throughout the duration of life. Similar to the OV Capron carbon results, the sample oxygen values from the M2s and the M3s indicate distinct differences in water intake across the duration of life. The M2 oxygen results are similar to the carbon results in that they're highly varied. The GO M2 samples resulted in slightly higher oxygen values in comparison to the sheep. The values present in some of the animals, particularly OC number 12 right here, were unusually high and potentially indicate the animals were watered, maybe through a trough or cistern. Again, similar to the carbon values, the third molars exhibit a shift towards lower oxygen values with less variation in contrast to the M2 samples. So subsequently, the M3 samples from the two different iron 2A phases were separated and mapped by inter two samples independently. The samples from the first iron 2A occupation demonstrate an increase of oxygen isotope values along the tooth from apex to root, whereas the samples from the second occupation demonstrate a decrease of oxygen values along the tooth at the same period of development. Only one outlier was noted in phase three, noted in purple, perhaps representing a different herd management practice from the other phase three animals, or is a residual remain from phase four. If these animals are born during the same time of year, they should follow the same water intake patterns. Thus, these results demonstrate that between the two phases, there is a potential shift in birth patterning and management, and potentially an environmental condition. The cattle samples all displayed average oxygen values slightly lower than the oxygen values in the OB caprine, but the sample show little to no differentiation across the molar type. So similar to the carbon oxygen results, some distinct similarities and differences are noted between the second and third molar strontium samples. The strontium samples from the M2 goats are significantly lower than the M2 individuals in the sheep, and both goats are identified as major outliers. 
The surrounding values present in the sampled goat molars indicate grazing locations outside the clear clustering of the other sampled individual. This suggests that the surrounding values from the sampled M2 goats reflect grazing locations that were not localized around her mammalian during the first year of life. Now, speculations on the place of origin are still in their beginning stages. However, it has been suggested that the goats potentially originated from Egypt. Based on the heavy number of Egyptian artifacts recovered from the site, along with previous surrounding studies in the region, particularly in the Nile Delta and Nile River Valley. Or they potentially originated from the Negev or further east from the Fainan region. Based on the influx of copper trade during the Iron Age period and similar matching strontium values. In contrast, the OB Caffrine thermolar samples show no distinction between species. One sample, OC number nine, displayed a slightly elevated signature in comparison to the other strontium values. It was identified as a statistical outlier. The shift in goat strontium values between the M2 and M3 samples display a change in grazing location from the first to the second year of life. This surrounding change indicates a high level of mobility in the goats at per simile. Now the absence of a shift in surrounding values between the second and third sheep molars suggests a lack of high mobility in the sheep, indicating differences in goat and sheep grazing locations during that first year of life. Now that outlier sheep appears to differ from the remaining OB caprine third molars in grazing locations, indicating a different herd management style from the other sheep samples. Based on surrounding sampling across the Southern Levant, it is lightly postulated that the sheep individual potentially originated from the Shvela region to the north of Kerbet Smeli, potentially indicating the movement of animal goods from a speculated secondary state or central core. It is important to note here that none of the OB caprines appear to have elevated strontium signatures that align with the known coastal plant strontium signatures it indicates that none of the animals appear to have been herded near the coast prior to arrival at Curb Mali. The majority of the cattle strontium samples are slightly elevated from the average strontium values observed in the OB caprines, but the cattle show little to no differentiation across molar types. Now, one M2 individual boss number three had a slightly lower strontium signature when compared to the other cattle samples and was identified as a minor outlier. I simply suggest that this individual probably originates from a different, still local grazing location from the other cattle. So returning to the overarching questions relating to food commodities that occur with mealy, the carbon auction and strontium results demonstrate a variety of animal commodities, both local and non-local, to the greater Hesse region coming into Kerbet Sumeli. Specifically, the results from the carbon isotopic analyses indicate that some of the OB calf ranks were herded outside of the local Hesse region prior to arrival at Kurt Smiley, based on that shift from a mixed C3, C4 diet to a primarily C3 diet in some of the sampled animals. Providing evidence for potential specialized pastoralists and a level of regional integration between producer and consumer. The results from the auction isotopic analyses indicate that OB cap brand auction values signified by that shift in water intake management practices during the animal's life indicate an importation of sheep and goat commodities into the site. While the cattle auction values indicate consistent local water intake, the change in water intake herd management for the sample of sheep and goats indicate that Kerbet Smiley potentially functioned as an administrative post. Again, possibly employing an indirect provisioning system based on that distinct shift between M2 and M3 molars. The results from the strontium isotopic analyses indicate that the OB caprines and cattle individuals were herded separately and distinctly, indicating the potential use of that indirect provisioning system. The non-local strontium signatures from those goat M2 molars and the outlier sheep, coupled with the inconsistent comparative values between the sheep and goats, indicate the arrival of animals from different specialized non-local pastoralists. While that cattle specimen was deviant in strontium values when compared to the other cattle, the deviation does not indicate a non-local herding location, but more likely indicates multiple local cattle pastoralists. So overall, the isotopic results of sheep, goat, and cattle remains from the IRA to a phases accurate smelling indicate a complex management and exploitation system. The carbon auction and strontium results suggest differential herd management at the hands of potential specialized pastoralists 
based on species. Bull sheep and cow displayed indicators of different local herd origins, while the goats displayed indicators of non-local herd origins. These results alone indicate the arrival of animals and decurbits mainly by potential specialized pastoralists utilizing an indirect provisioning system. This suggests that animals are exploited as economic food commodities as potential part of a larger integrated system. So taking a step back and integrating these isotopic results into the Iron 2A landscape in the Southern Levant, I argue here that Curvis Mealy was an administrative post potentially used for the redistribution of resources that was integrated into a secondary state during the mid to late 10th century. This is supported by the income of animals from a multitude of local herders in the surrounding hinterland and non-local animals coming from outside political entities, potentially Egypt and Egez or the Fanon region, and potential political cores situated in the Shvela. Following long theoretical paradigms, such as role systems analyses, corporate free models, and Parker's borderland matrix that have been adapted here for understanding micro-regional networks, these isotopic results are indicative of an administrative post that was in the peripheral region of an increasing political and economic entity, potentially the kingdom of Judah or Israel. While some scholars have suggested and argued that Kurt Smiley was simply occupied by the Philistines that had taken up residence along the coastal plain across the Southern Levant, the lack of coastal surrounding signatures within the sampled animals indicates that minimal interaction on a pastoralist level occurred between our site and the coast. This furthers the likelihood that Kurt Smiley was integrated into a political system that was potentially based in the Shvela region and the Southern Levant. Ultimately, the isotopic analyses of fungal remains from a small outpost site has illustrated the complex management and exploitation system that was enacted across potential core regions and peripheral hinterlands that support the rise of secondary states in the Southern Levant during the Iron Age II period. So I have so many people to thank. Um, all of them are listed here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you're interested or excited about excavations uh, in the Near East, we will be doing a field school in the summer of 2022. So I hope you all join us. And thank you. Thank you, Kara. That was a great presentation too. And after we have the time to our two presentations for today. <laughs> now we can move to the questions. Um, there are already posted some questions. And I don't know if Jennifer and Kira want to start right now. <laughs> okay. So our first question <laughs> is from Martin Mendt and it's for Jennifer. Martin is asking, has anyone analyzed variability in the execution of designs consistent width of lines, space between lines, etc., to assess standardization or maybe different potting traditions between different sites, communities, specializations? Um, no, and uh, that's something that um, I'm planning to do. Um, I still have to figure out the exact methodology that I, I'm gonna use, but I, I really do want to um, do a more detailed analysis on the iconography, um, not just in Chincha, but also um, just in, in other areas in the South Coast. I, I do have um, access to another collection from um, one of the other South Coast Valleys. And so that would be interesting to, to compare that and compare it with, uh, um, images of, uh, of pottery from some of the other valleys in the South Coast. So yeah, that's a really great question. Something that I'm hoping to do sometime in the future. Thank you, Jennifer. Our second question is from Tim Everhard and it's again for Jennifer. Tim is asking, what do you make of the shirts with anomalous pastes, particularly the shirts with a coarser paste or larger temper? Um, there really isn't anything that, well, there were a few that were anomalous, but there are too few. 
And so there was a lot of exchange in the South Coast. I'm thinking perhaps that that, that could be one possibility. Um, and the, the exchange was to like, what we know so far is that the, the material culture, so the pottery, um, the styles, the decorations, and uh, the, the architectural style was all very similar um, from, uh, yeah, throughout the South Coast. Um, so that, that could be a possibility. Um, another possibility could just be that it's, it's functional and so co coarser paste. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so um, another possibility is just that, um, yeah, the, the, the uh, coarser paste or larger temper could just be, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it could just be functional. But again, there's, there, there, uh, there's types uh, with, that I identified within my study. And um, uh, yeah, and there, there doesn't seem to be much that like is, is totally off. Um, Thank you. The next question, it's again from Tim, but this time it's for Kira. He's asking, Kira, what do you make of the polished astragali bone? Are they used in gaming? Oh, thanks, Tim, for your question. Um, yeah, those are cool, right? I love those ones. They're like my favorite uh, animal bone in general, aside from teeth. Um, <coughs> are they used for gaming? I feel like I can't say for certain right now. So usually when you find polished astragalite bones, they're often interpreted for gaming purposes. And even you see um, the sides of those astragalite like ground to be flat. So they land flat when you roll them. Um, they're found in uh, you know, what we think is a cultic space. Um, so were they used for more cultic divination purposes? Potentially, I can't say, it, you know, concretely if that's what they were used for or not, but I would lean more towards divination than I would for um, gaming just because they, they're polished, but they don't have that ground surface. Um, you can see really cool cut marks on them too, which is really exciting. Um, and I'm actually uh, working on a paper on those um, with my co-author, Jane Pardon, who I think is on this uh, call as well. So keep tuned. <laughs> We will. <laughs> Thank you, Kira. Our ne next question is again for you, and it's from Anissa Mara. She says, very informative presentation. My question is related to one of your outliners where you suggested it's possible origin from Egypt. I wondered if there is evidence from institutionalized trade between your study area and Egypt or such links are related to sporadic data. Yeah, so there's a lot. Thank you again, Anissa. Hi, uh, thank you for your question. Um, there's a lot of debate on what Egypt's role is during the Iron Two-Way period. Because previous to this, you have the Late Bronze Age where Egypt was everywhere. And then, you know, the famous Late Bronze Age collapse. Um, Egypt appears to try to hold on to the Levant, but kind of fails in doing so and their presence is, you know, kind of diminished and slips into that third intermediate period. Um, so there's not a lot of evidence for kind of institutionalized, like known trade that's happening. Um, so it seems, I mean, the excavators were pretty surprised to find as much Egyptian, like those Egyptian scarabs that they did. And I kind of explore this in my thesis on you know, is this an Egyptian outpost that kind of placed its spot in the landscape that's, you know, not quite large enough to be a real established site, but it's kind of almost siphoning off of the secondary state development and internalized trade that's happening. And Egypt's kind of just positioned there like, hey, we're here too, and we're going to kind of benefit from this. Uh, but we're just going to have this small site right next to, you know, like Tel El Hesse, which is a pretty big site in the region during this time. Um, you know, maybe they're storing stuff up there, who knows? Um, but it seems a bit spotty at this period. Thank you, Kira. The next 
question is again from Anissa Mara for Jennifer. She says, very interesting talk. I wanted to know if you identified some relation between burial context and the particular type of pottery. You touched this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could elaborate more on this issue. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, short answer, no. Uh, long answer, well, long answer is, uh, so um, the mortuary context um, that I have pottery from are heavily looted. Um, and that's just the norm in Peru because, uh, so on the coast, it's, it's very dry as a desert. And so a lot of stuff that has potential for the, the, the black, uh, art market, um, uh, can easily be found by just by looters. Um, and, um, they're also just really close to where people are living and so um so that that that's one problem um but from the 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 sherds and and the little bit of pottery that i was able to analyze from mortuary context um there doesn't seem to be um any specific type of pottery that is being um that is being um uh used exclusively for uh burial context um, and so right now what I'm thinking, um, is that that's something that I really want to delve a little bit deeper into, but, um, I, I think it is interesting, um, just based on what we know on the, on the, um, uh, mortuary practices of the area, um, it, it just, it, it, it does kind of align that the, the pottery that they're using in, um, domestic spaces that is going into mortuary context just because there, there, there are, um, they're revisiting burials and there's perhaps a sort of um, uh, celebrations or feasting or something going on uh, that the, the living are revisiting these graves and are um, doing some sort of traditions with, with the, the dead. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Charles Hastings, and it's for Kira. Kira, very interesting research. <laughs> you suggest that livestock that have not been locally grazed long term and brought in from elsewhere might indicate specialized herders. Why and what do you mean by this? Hi, Carol. Thanks for your question. And I'm actually really excited that someone asked this because I've been wrestling with this term specialized herders and what does that mean? What does it even mean to be a pastoralist? Um, you know, these are discussions that I, you know, I'm even having in my, you know, some of my classes is what does it mean to be a pastoralist? So in this context, situated within the Iron Age, um, I mean local pastoralists by those who are tethered to the site in this sense, Kerbet Sumili, and that is not their full-time uh, occupation. That is not what they're spending um, their entire, you know, livelihood on. Um, you know, they're herding their animals, but they're also um, participating in other subsistence strategies. When I say specialized pastoralists, and you know, we could have a broader discussion on that term in itself. Uh, specialized pastoralists, I mean, like that is their full-time occupation. Um, they're either tethered or mobile, um, but that is what they're doing 24-7 is taking care of their stock. They live off of um, their animals, both subsistence-wise and trading that uh, for like, you know, for goods and what have you, for secondary products. Um, and they're not necessarily just centralized around a particular site. And they're more so using that grazing and that long-term mobile aspect. I don't want to say they're, they're completely mobile because they might be tethered to a particular site. Um, I don't think I can say that. I, I definitely don't think I can say that with um, isotopic evidence that I have, um, but it does seem that there is some longer uh, journeys happening with the herders. And that's kind of why I say specialized and that they're more so completely focused on their herds. But again, I'm still wrestling with that term and 
trying to come up with better ways to describe that. But thank you for your question. Thank you, Kira, and thank you everyone for your question. I see that for the moment we don't have any more questions. We have two minutes left, so if anyone has the last minute question, feel free <laughs> to type them. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Kira and Jennifer, for your great talks. Our next brown bag talk will be next Friday. So we hope to see some of you there. <laughs>